Earlier this week, a U.S. federal indictment was unsealed, revealing that two Canadians are accused of being involved in an assassination plot. The plan involved an Iranian drug lord recruiting two Canadian Hells Angels to kill Iranians living in Maryland, an order that, allegedly, came from the government of Iran. Adrian Morrow is a U.S. correspondent for The Globe. He joins us to explain what we know about this plot, the people accused in it, and how this incident fits into bigger questions about foreign interference. I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and this is The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Adrian, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Manika. So there is a lot to this story, but but let's just begin with, you know, what exactly did the U.S. authorities reveal this past Monday? What they basically uh, revealed was that an Iranian drug lord uh, named uh, Naji Zandashti is accused of running a international assassination kidnapping ring uh, on behalf of the Iranian government. And so uh, this guy Zandashti, you know, for a long time has been kind of known or accused of, of being a sort of high volume international drug smuggler. Um, and what the U.S. Is, is now saying is that the government of Iran, in order to carry out some of these assassinations and kidnappings and, and tortures of, of dissidents in other countries, mm-hmm. um, kind of subcontracted this workout to Zandashti, presumably because they wanted to have have a, a couple steps of remove or some sort of plausible deniability that they were doing this. And then what prosecutors are alleging he did is that in the case of a couple of Iranians in, in Maryland, in the U.S., that the Iranian government wanted to go after, Sindashti subcontracted uh, a hit job on them to uh, a couple of Canadians, one of whom is uh, a member of the Hells Angels, another is a Hells Angels associate, and that he essentially conspired with them to carry out a, a hit. Hmm. Okay. Uh, when was this alleged to have happened, Adrian? We're talking about this potential hit, but w- when is the timeline here? It's December 2020 to March of 2021. And hmm. they, they essentially have uh, communications through uh, an encrypted messaging app that these three guys you know, allegedly used to, to plan this hit. Um, and they have messages that basically span that, that four-month period. Okay. And, and we should, I guess, be clear here. These people, though, that we're talking about, they were naturally killed, right? This hit actually didn't happen? That's correct. Uh, the indictment doesn't specify exactly why the hit didn't happen. There was a U.S. prosecutor who said that the plot was thwarted before it, it was able to be carried out, um, but but did not clarify exactly why that was or how the, the plot was thwarted. Okay. So, Adrian, let, let's talk about some of the main people named in this indictment then. Uh, it sounds like there's kind of three key players we should talk about. So so let's go through the three of them, uh, starting with Zendashti. Who, who is he? So Zindashti has been known for years as an international drug kingpin. You know, has been suspected of, of smuggling heroin uh, between um, Turkey, Iran, um, and some other you know locations around the Middle East. He's had at least one um, incident where his 19-year-old daughter was killed by a rival drug cartel um, some years ago. He has a, a reportedly has a previous Canadian connection that the Vancouver Sun uh, some years ago um, unearthed um, information about a, a plot where he hired a couple of Canadian hitmen to kill um, a rival drug lord in Dubai, and then those two Canadian hitmen later turned up dead in, in British Columbia. So this is a guy who, you know, for years has been uh, apparently sort of known as a um, as an international drug kingpin. Um, and what the U.S is alleging now is that he, on top of this, uh, has some sort of deal with the Iranian government where they used him or used his services to organize these, these international um, assassination kidnapping plots. And in addition to the indictment, the U.S. Treasury Department listed a number of, of previous cases in which they um, they accused Zindashti and, and his network of carrying out uh, assassinations, kidnappings, um, and tortures in, uh, I think, at least five different countries, including the Netherlands, um, Iraq, Turkey. They say that Zindashti uh, has been connected to, or that his network has been connected to, um, at least one previous murder in Canada. They don't say what that murder was. And so it's unclear whether that's a reference to the Vancouver Sun's reporting that he had hired these Canadian hitmen who later turned up dead, or whether he actually carried out some sort of political assassination in Canada on behalf of the Iranian government, which, if true, would be um, absolutely explosive. But I, I asked the Treasury Department who made that allegation the other day, and they uh, and they never replied. Okay, and so it, it sounds like then he was actually subcontracting out stuff to to these two Canadians. So, so who are they, and what do we know about them? Yeah, so the the first person that Zindashti is is accused of speaking with. 
It's a guy named uh, Damian Ryan, who is a uh, full patch member of the Hells Angels and has a, a lengthy uh, a history of, of criminal accusations in, in Canada. Um, he's originally from Vancouver, later relocated to Ontario. He's believed to be a, a full patch member of a, a Hells Angels chapter in Ontario, as well as one in Greece. And, and he's also, uh, police have said previously that he's a member of the Wolf Pack, which is a sort of criminal alliance between um, a number of different Canadian organized crime figures uh, implicated in, in traffic drugs from from Mexico to Canada. Uh, you know, Mr. Ryan himself uh, was accused in, in 2022 of being part of a large international drug smuggling ring that was uh, was trafficking uh, fentanyl, cocaine, and, and methamphetamine between uh, Colombia, Mexico, Canada, with connections to Greece uh, as well. Uh, he was charged a second time in, in 2023 after police raided his house in Ottawa um, and, and allegedly found uh, you know dozens of illegal guns. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's uh, so he's currently in, in pretrial custody in, in Manitoba, um, mm-hmm. waiting to go on on trial over a, a bevy of basically organized crime, you know, drug smuggling and illegal gun charges in Canada. Yeah, and then the second Canadian is is someone named Pearson. Who is he? Adam Pearson. Uh, is believed to be an associate of uh, of the Hell's Angels, and he killed a guy in Alberta, in Grand Prairie, Alberta, in 2019. Fled from police and was illegally living in Minneapolis for a period of time, uh, including when he was allegedly uh, contracted by Damian Ryan uh, to be involved in this uh, in this murder plot uh, in Maryland. He was subsequently tracked down by the FBI and arrested in Minneapolis. He was extradited to Canada and he and he pleaded guilty uh, last year to manslaughter. And he's currently serving an eight year prison sentence in Alberta. Do I guess do we know, Adrian, how Zendashi came into contact with the Canadians, like how how they met? Not clear. I mean, you can see overlaps in what Mr. Zandashti was, you know, was doing as a drug lord um, and what Mr. Ryan uh, is accused of having done. Mm -hmm. They're both accused of having run these kind of large um, international uh, drug trafficking networks. You know, Mr. Ryan has a connection to Greece and and lived there for a period of time, um, which is not obviously not very far from Turkey, where Mr. Zandashti has been based in the past. So there are sort of potential connections. Um, The Vancouver Sun, you know, which has done a lot of reporting about Mr. Ryan, over the years um, has, has tied him with a number of uh, Iranian Canadian men who are wanted in, in different murders and, and other other kind of crimes in the lower mainland. But the prosecutors in the U.S. have not said exactly how they, you know, how they allegedly connected. Hmm. And the indictment actually quoted some of the messages between the men uh, and they were using an, an, an encrypted app. Uh, so what do we know about this app, Adrian, and also what what they were saying to each other? So the the app, which is called uh, Sky ECC, was uh, was owned by a company called Sky Global that was based in in Vancouver. Um, and Sky Global was actually shut down in uh, March of 2021 uh, because prosecutors in the U.S. and authorities in in Europe um, accused it of being a front for organized crime. And it was essentially a super secure app where you had to buy some sort of special secondary phone that would just run this app and would mm-hmm. allow you to sort of communicate anonymously, um, you know, via this app. Yeah, you know, the the company was was based out of Vancouver and was, was shut down eventually because, you know, authorities in both the US and Europe thought that it was solely set up to be used for purposes such as what allegedly happened here, where people would use it in order to, to plan crimes. On this app, there was essentially a negotiation where, you know, Zendashti agreed to pay uh, $350,000 US plus $20,000 worth of expenses um, in order for this, this hit to occur. You know, allegedly, um, Ryan agreed to that. And and then there was a whole sort of back and forth between, uh, you know, allegedly between Ryan and Pearson, where they talked about, uh, you know, how how to do the the assassination. And uh, and according to the U.S. indictment, um, what they essentially said was that they were going to put together three or four, you know, gunmen to go to Maryland and, and do this hit. And uh, and they talked about how it would have to be overkill, that it'd have to send a message, um, and that in order to do that, the assassins were going to have to, you know, shoot at least one of the dissidents, you know, multiple times in the head. Uh, Pearson is alleged to have said in this app that they needed to, uh, you know, erase his head from his torso as a way of of sending a message with the uh, with the assassination. Wow. And and again, this assassination didn't actually happen. It, and it sounds like we don't we don't really know why it didn't happen. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, one prosecutor did say the other day that that it was thwarted somehow before it was it was carried out. 
A couple of possibilities, if you read between the lines. One is that you know Sky Global, which which hosted this app that that was allegedly being used to plan the hit, was shut down in March 2021, uh, around the same time that the timeline ends in the indictment. Um, so that could be just an indication that all of the police evidence in this comes from this app, and that once the app was shut down, the uh, the police had no further visibility into what the communications were. It could very well be that in in the app getting shut down, in U.S. prosecutors laying charges against that's the um, the CEO of Sky Global. You know they uh, they got access to what was being said you know on this network, and that that was sort of what led them to to foil this alleged plot. You know also we know that Pearson was was arrested by the FBI on an outstanding warrant uh, from Canada while he was living illegally in Minneapolis. So it's also possible that police um, kind of came into the the plot that way by arresting him and then discovering other information that led them to to uncover what's was allegedly happening here. Mm. Uh, we don't know for certain, but but those seem to be a couple of, of possibilities. Yeah. But I guess help me understand here, Adrian, because, you know, the two Canadian men that we were talking about, they're, they're both in prison right now. Uh, Zandashti is in Iran. So I guess tangibly, what does this indictment actually mean? Highly unlikely that Zandashti is, is going to actually be uh, put on trial by the U.S. over this unless he does something um, you know, like transits through a country that has an extradition treaty like with the U.S. and mm-hmm. and somebody is able to sort of track him down that way. You know, as long as he stays in Iran and as long as Iran continues to have a government that's, you know, completely hostile to the United States, it's very unlikely that he would, would face um, extradition from Iran. In the case of, of Ryan and Pearson, because they're both in the Canadian justice system, Canada and the U.S. have an extradition treaty, which gets used frequently. Currently, uh, both uh, Ryan and Pearson are, are before the Canadian legal system. Uh, you know, Pearson in, in prison in Alberta um, and, and Ryan in, in pretrial custody in, in Manitoba. What will essentially have to happen is that those two will have to finish up their dealings with the Canadian legal system. And then at that point, uh, they could face extradition to the U.S. to be tried uh, here. Um, so in, in the case of Pearson, that would mean once he finishes his, uh, his eight-year prison sentence in Alberta, um, he could then be extradited to the U.S. Um, in the case of, of Ryan, he'll have to finish his his trials in, um, in Manitoba and Ontario. Um, and then if he's acquitted, would potentially face extradition then, or if he's convicted, would serve his sentence in Canada first, um, and then could potentially be extradited to the U.S. So it could be a few years before there's, there's any trial um, you know, here in the States, uh, but we don't know at this point you know, exactly when that'll be or how long that'll take. We'll be back in a minute. So, Adrian, why would Iran want to target people like this in the U.S.? It's unclear exactly because the the identities of the potential targets in in this case uh, have not been been released. But there are uh, some different you know possibilities. I mean, one might be if if these people were uh, Iranian dissidents uh, who were you know criticizing the government of Iran abroad. You know, their government of Iran might might have wanted to kill them to to send a message to, to other dissidents uh, to basically you know to stop criticizing the uh, the Iranian government mm-hmm. um, or to say leaving Iran and and fleeing to a Western country is not enough to to protect you. Um, um, sort of as a way of, of showing strength. We don't know 100% because we don't know exactly who the, the people were that were targeted, but mm-hmm. um, but you can certainly sort of speculate on a couple of reasons why um, an authoritarian regime like Iran's would want to, uh, to, to silence uh, people who've defected. So this is an example of a killing being planned in one country to, to supposed to be carried out in another. Uh, so this is an extra territorial killing, essentially, right? Adrian, like, what does this mean for the country where the murders are committed? Yeah, if if something like this were ever to to go forward, it, it would represent a, a huge you know violation of sovereignty. It's a, a violation of of you know United Nations um, statutes. You know any country would regard this as a um, as a breach of sovereignty mm-hmm. to have any country you know including a, a country that's hostile to it as, as Iran as the United States you know allegedly order killings. Uh, to happen on the territory of another country. Mm -hmm. Of course, this reminds me of the conversations that we've been having, uh, especially a few months ago, about the killing of a a Sikh activist in British Columbia, uh, Hardeep Singh Nijjar, right? So I I wonder, does this current situation, does that differ from the situation in B.C.? It's similar in terms of of what's alleged to have happened here. The notion that you basically have a foreign government is alleged to have ordered up uh, the killing of of somebody that they don't like in another country. What makes it a little bit different is the the, the broader context in the sense that the killing of Mr. Nitcher in um, in British Columbia created this whole sort of diplomatic problem for the Canadian government because you know Canada and India, both democratic countries, both have um, you know a, a long history together, and um, and Canada has I think 
very as, as always sort of wanted to have a good relationship with India. Um, and so I think that that was sort of a lot of the the complication there that there was this whole sort of question of how do you try to hold a country accountable when you believe that they've done something like this um, while at the same time continuing to to keep up you know your sort of good diplomatic relations with them in some ways with Iran it's actually less complicated because the US and Iran have no relationship I mean it's very clear that Iran is uh, run by a theocratic authoritarian government you know that that has no real re- relationship with the United States mm-hmm. um, and which the US has long seen as an enemy and and vice versa and so in a sense there isn't really anything to kind of be compromised here. This this diplomatic question is interesting, though, because as you say, you know, if, if the U.S. and Iran don't really have a, a relationship, I, I guess that, that makes me kind of wonder, though, what that means for the U.S. with a situation like this. So politically speaking, I mean, yeah, what do these allegations mean for the U.S.? And, and I guess what situation does it put President Joe Biden in? It raises a lot of uh, of questions about security. I'm sure that that the U.S. government would argue that that this shows that they have pretty good security in the sense that that this this never actually came to pass. That whatever was allegedly going on here, the U.S. government discovered it um, and put a stop to it before it could happen. So they they might argue that that their system is working as it should, and and of course it just contributes even more to the adversarial enemy relationship that the U.S. has with the Iranian government. You know, we're already seeing that play out in in so many different ways with, um, you know, of course, Houthi rebels backed by Iran shooting, you know, rockets at ships in the Red Sea. Um, Three U.S. soldiers were killed at a a base in in Jordan uh, this past weekend by uh, another Iranian-backed militia. Mm. You know, Joe Biden is under a lot of pressure to, to respond in those attacks. Biden is in this very sort of difficult spot of, on one hand, wanting to respond in order to to deter militias and deter Iran from doing this sort of thing. But he's also very much attempting not to escalate the fighting that's already happening in the in the Middle East into a, uh, a full-fledged war between the U.S. and Iran. Yeah. Yeah. So there's it sounds like there's a few geopolitics at play here that he, he's trying to kind of weigh and think about. And I guess we, sh- we should mention, too, though, because, uh, of course, a, a little while ago, the U.S. was trying to work with Iran, right? I, I'm thinking about, like, the deal with Iran that o- Obama was working on. I, I guess, you know, can we talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like that has kind of, in a way, maybe taken away the incentive for the, the two countries to work together. Yeah, that's right. So during the Obama administration, there was a, a deal uh, between the U.S. and, and Iran and, and European countries where the West was was going to um, you know lift some sanctions on Iran and sort of help them uncripple their economy in exchange for Iran not developing nuclear weapons. When Donald Trump came into office, he said this is a terrible deal and he, and he tore it up. Um, and so it's possible that, that Iran concluded at that point that they weren't likely to really get anything further out of this attempt at dealing with uh, with the United States. And so perhaps they've just they've concluded that um, that because they have nothing to lose, they might as well just do whatever they want, um, you know, vis-a-vis the United States, uh, and they don't really have any any disincentive from planning these these kinds of assassinations and, and kidnappings. Adrian, I also want to ask you about Canada because there were two Canadians involved in all of this. So how is the news of this indictment being playing out here? What Melissa Lanceman, the deputy leader of the Conservative Party, uh, said the other day was that this is a further uh, reason for the Canadian government to um, designate Iran's uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps as a, a terrorist entity, um, which so far the Canadian government has been reluctant to do. Um, they've designated part of the, the Guards Corps that does uh, foreign operations as a terrorist entity, but not the entire Guards Corps, because they've essentially argued that because there's universal military service in Iran, that trying to sanction everybody who's been part of, of those armed forces as a terrorist um, would, would be an and necessarily wide drag net would catch a bunch of people who haven't actually done anything. Um, but the U.S. government has designated the entire Revolutionary Guards Corps as a terrorist entity. And um, at least one you know, Iranian-Canadian social justice activist has estimated that there are about um, 700 people in Canada who are agents of the, of the Iranian government um, in some capacity. And so mm. the argument from the conservatives is that Canada needs to get more serious about that, that anybody who's potentially working for the, the government in Tehran could be, you know, spying on or intimidating or threatening, you know, Iranian dissidents in, in Canada. And so the, the Canadian government has to do a better job of, um, you know, protecting those people um, and and pushing back against the, the possibility of, uh, of malign, you know, influence from the Iranian government. And the Conservative Party uh, this week put in a request formally to include uh, Iran in the inquiry into foreign interference, uh, which is already looking at uh, China and India. Hmm. And of course, you know, we're, we're talking about foreign interference as, as well right now because that the, the inquiry into foreign interference in Canada just got underway at the end of January. So I guess, Adrian, before I let you go, I, I want to ask you kind of big picture. Like, how does this story that we're talking about, how does it fit into larger conversations that we're having right now about foreign interference in Canada? 
I think it shows you just how uh, how potentially widespread it is. You know that it's not just a question of foreign interference from China, which is how you know a lot of this conversation got started. It's not just a question of foreign interference from India, which um, is, is what uh, Justin Trudeau you know last year raised with the accusation that that, that the Indian government is behind uh, assassinations and attempted assassinations in Canada and the U.S. Um, but you've now got yet another country that you can you can add to the list. You know, and, and we knew that there had been accusations from within the, the Iranian Canadian community that there were agents of influence working for the Iranian government in Canada. You know, th- those accusations, you know, go back years. But this, I think, kind of shines a harsher spotlight on that. Um, and I think it's the sort of thing that's going to become a, is already, I think, a major political issue and, and probably will become even more so. Adrian, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Michal Stein produced this episode. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Rachel Levy-McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Adrian Chung is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.